चला मी हे सुरू करतो मग तुम्ही इंट्रोडक्शन केलंच सरांनी सुरू कमळे सर सुरू करा येस सुरू करू गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑफ यू आय वुड लाईक टू इंट्रोड्यूस टुडेज रिसोर्स पर्सन डॉक्टर अनर्घा दोरडे मॅडम फर्स्टली वेलकम इन द पी एच डी कोर्स वर्क प्रोग्राम डॉक्टर अनर्घा इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ जॉग्रोफी करंटली वर्किंग ॲट द पोस्ट ग्रॅज्युएट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जॉग्रोफी नर्सोजी वाडिया कॉलेज पुणे सी हॅज डन हर मास्ट हर मास्टर्स इन जॉग्रोफी and phd from the department of geography savitribai phule pune university she has earlier worked as lecturer in the department of geography sp college uh, sp pune university for 3 years and was also associated with the teaching assignment for the pg bsc and msc geoinformatics for 8 years her field of specialization is coastal geomorphology and she has completed her doctor doctoral research on beach and creek sedimentation process her research interest in all geomorphology coastal geomorphology and environmental studies particular particularly in holding us of geoinformatics she has completed two minor and two major research projects funded by bcd saitribai phule university ugc and isro dr anargha dorde has published 25 research paper in various national and international journals and presented over 35 research papers at the national and international conferences based on the global scholar c has a h index of 6 at present three research scholars are pursuing their phd under her supervision while three students have been awarded the degree once again i heartily welcome madam in this program so i like to request dr anarga madam to guide us thank you just a second give me a minute yes ma'am uh is my screen visible yes ma'am it's coming up yes yes ma'am okay. it's visible now okay yes good afternoon to all at the outset let me take this opportunity to thank the principal of sp college for inviting me today i am also thankful to the head of the geography department professor sunil daikwad sir coordinator of this program professor devne sir and joint coordinator dr dhawale sir for inviting me to deliver a lecture in the phd course work program students i'll be taking today your lecture on the topic paradigms in geomorphology before we venture into the paradigms of geomorphology let's get acquainted with the term paradigm and paradigm shift paradigm can be put in the most simple way as the way a person see and interpret or let's say assumes a particular thing it is essentially an assemblage of beliefs values and techniques so we can say that paradigm relates to assumptions concepts values and practices that constitute a way of viewing reality for the entire community that shares them and especially in an intellectual discipline here what is what we expect is the wide acceptance of the thought or that concept which has evolved putting it in more technical way paradigm can be defined 
as a model of scientific process or the ideas those are used for solving research problems with a generally accepted set of rules and conventions it was thomas kohn who in 1962 in his book the structure of scientific revolution first came up with the word paradigm and paradigm shift in geography we find the reference as back as 1967 where peter haggett and rj shorley in their chapter on models paradigms and new geography have spoken about the paradigms and the shifting nature of the paradigms especially in geography now when we talk about the paradigm in nutshell we can say it is a concept which is such a strong concept or a belief which is being accepted by the scientific community at that point of time and then we come to the term that is paradigm shift paradigm shift relates to a way of looking at something differently in a different aspect the same paradigm is there but it is being viewed in different way the perception has changed now it is basically shifting of our beliefs or concept of the same thing previously assumed or viewed in some other way so we can have certain examples like the movement or the shifting of the concept of scientific theory of ptolemic system which was like earth at the center of the universe the this particular paradigm was very much established in that particular time which which is very famously known as the ptolemaic system or ptolemaic theory and then there was a shift of this paradigm from ptolemaic system to copernican system and what copernicum system told us was that that earth is not at the center of the universe but the sun that is at the center of the universe so it is heliocentric universe so this is the shift this is what uh, i mean over here when i am talking about a particular paradigm earth at the center of the universe is the first paradigm a concept which is being put forth which is being accepted at that time period and then there is a shift in this paradigm or this concept from the earth at the center of the universe to the sun at the center of the universe or maybe in the later state we have the shifting of the paradigms of newtonian physics to the theory of relativity and from there on to the quantum physics so it was basically thomas kuhn who have written a very elaborate essay re referring to the term paradigm and shifts in the paradigm in 1962 where he argues that science does not evolve gradually towards the truth science has a paradigm which remains constant before going through a paradigm shift when current theories can't explain some phenomena and someone proposes a new theory here it is very important for us to understand that kun proposes the scientific scientific principles or the scientific concept in terms of the what he calls as the normal science so any normal science will build up its paradigm its concept and it is such a strong concept that it will be accepted widely it will rule for a particular period then a period will come which i'll be explaining to you in the next diagram now this is the diagram which tells us about the stages of or the phases of paradigms how it is shifting this was as i told you basically given by kuhn in 1962 and later on the adaptations figurative adaptations were were given by rana l in 2020 so let us look at this diagram for better understanding the shifting nature of paradigms so in the beginning what kuhn wants to tell us is that this curved lines three curved lines which we can see he is calling that stage or the phase as pre paradigm phase so the first phase of scientific development according to him is it in a dis any particular discipline is a pre paradigm period and it is a state of science at its infancy the phase of immature science it is or it is the period which is lacking a general consensus since the phase is marked by conflicts between several distinct schools which grow around individual scientists it may be labeled as multi uh, multi pragmatic as each school of thought develops its own model solution so this is a period basically many sc uh, schools of thoughts would come together or may be working differently and they will be coming to a particular uh, scientific principle and trying to find a solution over here now in this particular state what we find is that within the multiplicity of the competing schools there exist a very low level of specialization in discipline and the concept doesn't take a 
a particular or realistic uh, form over here now from this pre uh, paradigm phase it travels that particular thought or concept it travels to a phase which is called as professionalism phase now this professionalism phase it is the scientific development which marches into the professionalism phase and it takes place when we have new researches that are undertaken and the discipline makes a general progress the this particular phase is represented uh, or it represent the stage of scientific maturity in that particular subject so there is some kind of scientific maturity which is being gained in that particular uh, field of uh, study and once it has reached we enter the third phase which is called as paradigm phase 1 which is characterized by a dominating school of thought a single thought is evolved in this particular phase which has often in quite a short space of time displaced others means it has refuted the other thoughts or it has displaced the other thoughts and that single thought is now very prominent now this establishment of paradigm leads to concentrated research within a clearly distinguishable problem area an activity which is which kun describes as a normal science a mature science according to him experiences an alternative phases of normal science and then we enter a phase which is called as a crisis phase or a revolutionary phase now this period of conceptual continuity in a discipline in the phase of the normal science is there as long as there is a consensus within the discipline normal science will continue that thought will continue the paradigm will continue but once the uh, once the crisis is generated by here crisis what i mean is that that particular thought or that particular paradigm is being challenged or maybe there are certain new thoughts or new research results are being obtained which may support the previous paradigm or more so more than uh, su supporting it might suggest a totally different aspect or different uh, principle which can evolve so that is a period of crisis or the revolution now let's say for example again if i go back to the previous periods like uh, the transition from ptolemic astronomy to uh, aristotelic dynamics this can be a one example a period which was governed by the ptolemic principles and then you have more scientific knowledge being added to that which was the crisis period when the things were getting added to it or new concepts totally new concepts were evolving and we moved on to the second phase that is the paradigm phase 2 now however this period of normal science what kun wants to tell us is sooner or later will be replaced by a crisis period and as a crisis period ends when a new paradigm of course this crisis period is going to end only when a new very strong principle is going to get established this principle should be so strong that it will refute or it will make the previous principle or the previous paradigm almost obsolete it will no longer be taken up and we will be looking up only up to the new paradigm as i told you in the previous slide the very simple example can be that we have the earth as the center of the universe that was refuted by a new theory new paradigm that was the copernican theory that is sun at the center of the universe so when the new theory came up the old theory became obsolete that was totally refuted one thing i like to put over here or emphasize that when kun is talking about these different phases then he uh, particularly mentioned it that once a particular paradigm is established then it will settle for a longer time or maybe a shorter time until and unless a crisis period or a revolutionary period is being faced by that particular paradigm new thoughts new people uh, scientific world will be having more technological advancement and new thoughts or research will come up and that might totally replace the previous one so for the new paradigm to establish to establish this is the uh, flattening of the curve which we can see over here it is a paradigm phase 2 to establish it it has to refute or to replace the old paradigm according to kun in normal sciences two paradigms the old one and the new one cannot survive together they cannot be together so for the new paradigm to establish it has to refute the old one this particular process will keep on going till you reach to the 
uh, again the revolutionary phase in the paradigm 2 then the paradigm 3 will get come up and then you will have another totally new curve coming up over here so according to kun what we see is that the old paradigm is sufficiently replaced and the cycle thus begins all over again so it is a cyclic process because our knowledge about the world is never complete and in the post revolution period uh, post revolution period i'm talking about only the paradigms over here the new paradigm dominance is fully established now once we know what is a paradigm we also know so far that how the paradigm shifts and when the paradigm shift how the old paradigm will be obsolete i'm again and again emphasizing one point over here as far as paradigm and paradigm shifts are concerned that this was basically given this particular thought was given by kun and he talks about the normal science at a later stage we will try to after we have seen the paradigms and the paradigm shifts in geomorphology uh, before i conclude i'll be touching this particular point again so let us look at the paradigms in geomorphology Now the earliest paradigm in geomorphology was catastrophism. Catastrophism, as we know, which was the basic thought which evolved and which remained there for quite a longer time. So it was somewhere around one thousand sixty-six to one thousand five hundred thirty-six. It was the period when it was evolving, and people were uh, trying to understand catastrophism, and it was getting established. There were biblical thoughts. and uh, there were uh, catastrophism basically spoke about how the world was uh, world world has evolved the earth and the species on the earth have evolved over a very short period of time in say let's say sporadic uh, events or catastrophic events and that is why it is called as catastrophism and this particular thought as i told you uh, this particular paradigm it remained it sustained for a very very long time till 1830 so till let's say early 19th century catastrophism was much much in vogue at that point of time this paradigm was well established now by the end of the 18th century still we find that there was no clear distinction between igneous and sedimentary rocks not only this geological time was still measured in thousand of years if you have studied catastrophism in detail you must be knowing that the uh, uh, age of the earth or the age of the earth or Uh, the period that they have calculated at that point of time it was mere 6000 years and if you look at that geological time was so we can say that it was not measured in millions of years but it was in few thousand years only and the erosional capacity of the sea and glaciers was appreciated no better than that of the rivers so fluvial uh, aspects they were knowing a little bit but they were not Uh, ready to accept that the way the sea and the glaciers will be working on the land and for carving out the landforms it is slightly different or more different in the than the fluvial one so that was not appreciated so we have to understand that the first paradigm or rather i'll say it is not the first paradigm but the earliest paradigm in geomorphology it sustained for more than 200 years over there and it by even by the 18th century end of the 18th century uh, certain facts that we are knowing now were not being established now 40 years later by 1840 somewhere catastrophism had been refuted it was being displaced it the the paradigm saw a shift in it so we went from catastrophism to two different uh, stages of paradigms or two different beliefs i'll say over here the overthrow of this long standing belief of catastrophism came in two stages the first one is uniformitarianism and the second one or the second principle or the concept was glacial theory now if you look at both of them uniformitarianism and glacial theory with a long standing of the earlier paradigm of catastrophism which was refuted by both of these uniformitarianism and glacial theory in retrospect it is nothing less than a revolution in scientific thought itself so it was in 1788 when hutton came up with this particular coin this particular term that is uniformitarianism which you must have studied about the uh, basic principles of geomorphology what hutton talks about 
that the present is the key to the past and how we can look at the uh, processes those are going on today for carving out the landforms and how they are uh, let's say respond or how we can study from that how what must have happened or occurred in the past then uh, hutton though he gave this particular concept in 1788 it didn't gain much momentum it didn't gain much appreciation at the same time and it was a little later somewhere in 1830 when charles lyell came up uh, with his further research on this topic and he supported the concept of uniformitarianism which was initially proposed by hutton this uniformitarianism became a paradigm once it was established and the scientific community accepted it widely as a new principle this particular uniformitarianism according to hart who have written a very good uh, essay related to the development of uh, paradigms and the shifts in the paradigms and he says that uniformitarianism is uh, was a much deep and comprehensive concept and according to hart it was more than a paradigm and that is why he calls uniformitarianism as a super paradigm now as i said along with uniformitarianism there was a second stage of belief which came into existence at par as far as the time scale is concerned with uniformitarianism so it was in late 18 to late 19 or early 19th century the glacial theory was also proposed this theory proposed the mechanism that move glaciers boulders and icebergs and this theory also spoke about discovery of the ice age around 1830 now though this particular concept and principle was being proposed somewhere around the late 18th and the early 19th century it didn't gain that much of momentum it didn't get wide appreciation as the uniformitarianism got the uh, wide acceptance as a paradigm and that is why the glacial theory ha have never found a way out at that time period to formulate that particular concept as a paradigm now Uh, th there is a one surprising element uh, to this that we have we will be finding that a particular theory or which will be established or which can be talked about as a paradigm it will be established not only because of its own uh, say uh, characteristics but it will be also dependent on the that current time scientific community so as i said glacial theory couldn't gain the status of paradigm at that point of time when uniformitarianism was being accepted as a paradigm it was much later it was accepted when the then school which were working on this especially in the europe the there was a shift in the leadership and then after this shifting of the leadership we find that the glacial theory was being accepted as a principle or a, as a paradigm coming to uniformitarianism what we find is that we have the uh, we have the proposing of uh, cycle of erosion by davis after the uniformitarianism but cycle of erosion though is a principle we are going to call it as a paradigm it really did not replace uniformitarianism concept it still remains so there was no paradigm shift as far as we are talking about from uniformitarianism to cycle of erosion and why so as i said the cycle of erosion which was given in 1884 and later on again reworked by w m davis in 1909 in his lengthy essays it is referred to as the first paradigm in geomorphology now here i might contradict myself because in the beginning i said catastrophism is the earliest paradigm in geomorphology but here i am saying cycle of erosion is the first paradigm in geomorphology now this is because the term geomorphology it came into existence near the end of 19th century and this term basically was introduced by geologist so prior to that prior to the division era there was no science which was called as geomorphology but there were developments in geology and natural sciences so when we are talking about catastrophism when you are talking about the uniformitarianism then those work relates to the natural sciences or the geological sciences it was only during the division period when this term 
came up into the existence that is geomorphology and that is why cyclohydrogen becomes the first paradigm in geomorphology rather it was lossmann who in 1858 he was a german fellow he coined the term geomorphology and later on maggi who is a english researcher who reiterated this term geomorphology in 1888 and during the same time the division theory was proposed and thus as i said cycle of erosion becomes the first paradigm in geomorphology now cycle of erosion was further replaced by plate tectonics in 1967 now this revolution which was brought by the shifting of cycle of erosion paradigm to plate tectonics it is brought by a particular author that is hallam in 1973 in his book a revolution in earth science from continental drift apart from uh, hallam there are certain authors who are talking about paradigms in geomorphology the most recent literature that i could find on paradigms in geomorphology and the shifting nature of paradigms in geomorphology by, was by orme in 2002 he has identified eight basic paradigms in the earth sciences remember again he is not talking especially only related to geomorphology but he is talking as earth science as whole where he says that these eight uh, basic paradigms in earth sciences are uniformitarianism catastrophism should come first actually glacial theory uniform flow theory mass movement theory cycle of erosion continental mobility and quantitative geomorphology now we are going to look at the changing paradigms or what are the paradigms in geomorphology the first paradigm in geomorphology is evolutionary geomorphology so i'll be talking about here around five different paradigms and how there is a shift from one paradigm to another paradigm with the new concepts being introduced with the new researchers being pouring in so first is the evolutionary geomorphology which we will talk in detail that relates to division cycle er erosional cycle then formation of peneplains time where he talks about time as a process and there are also questions which are being put forth by pink especially related to the formation of peneplain then the second paradigm is process geomorphology given by gilbert where he talks about landforms achieving equilibrium between resisting forces and driving forces and he also takes help of the division triad and talks about process form and time then we come to the third paradigm that is quantitative dynamic paradigm uh, sorry quantitative dynamic geomorphology now here what we find is that the advent of the new knowledge with the advent of new knowledge and the researches being carried out by horton and straler especially in terms of drainage basin morphology then we have the newtonian mechanistic approach like the stream power fluvial erosion and so on where schum and melton have worked a lot and then we have dynamic equilibrium approach like the tectonic geomorphology landform tectonics climate coupling and so on after the quantitative dynamic geomorphology we have the fourth paradigm in geomorphology that is thermodynamic geomorphology where we will be talking about very briefly touching the concept of entropy uh, entropy which was given by Lip leopold and longbein in 1962 and there is a very detailed essay which has been written by shedegger in 1970 and uh, in the recent period by hagget in 2007 where they talk about application of uh, the thermodynamic laws of physics in geomorphology and especially talking about entropy concept and lastly Uh, the present era of the paradigm where we have the paradigm that is predictive geomorphology so most of the people researchers are today focusing on the predictive geomorphology where we are talking about the earth crust then mathematical morphology or mathematical modeling more of deterministic and numerical models are being generated more of empirical analysis is being carried out and also artificial neural network for which we called as ann is done let us look at the first paradigm of geomorphology that is evolutionary geomorphology this particular concept of davis that is the cycle of erosion we are all well versed with 
it part of train towards seeing everything in light of darwinian evolutionary theory which we know that uh, davies has put his theory on the basis of the darwin's evolutionary theory and he's he states that landscapes evolve throughout the time stage of evolution can be determined by examining the characteristics of the landscape which implies that time is the critical factor in determining the landscape what it looks like now this particular division framework was applied to study of valleys forms valley forms and tectonic uplift and it was also further extended to glacial coastal arid and volcanic landforms i think we all know that uh, davis has described the landforms as a function of structure process and stage and he basically emphasizes as i told you in the beginning that he has more of his lean uh, he was more leaning towards the darwinian evolutionary theory so he coined the terms youth maturity and old age into his concept of cycle and he uses geological time scales in millions of years this is a important thing over here davis work has appeared in many geomorphological textbooks now we know that even today we are whenever we are opening a geomorphological textbook or we are teaching to our students division theory is a must we do talk about the division theory we do tell our students about the division theory what are its fundamental principles how what are its working and so on but here i'm i'm phrasing it in this way that it appears in geomorphological textbooks and were of historic importance it was of very historic importance because much of the research was carried out in the earlier stage was based on division theory but they have been largely superseded in more recent times and why so because it lacks the predictive power and quantitative nature division theory is more descriptive in nature and as of today we all know lot of things have come up many principles have changed many paradigms have changed and we, we are more now oriented towards quantifying everything putting it in a particular form, model and predicting it which the division framework lacks this particular power of predicting or even it doesn't have the quantification quantitative nature and that is the reason that i'm talking about the serious re researches those are being carried out in geomorphology they uh they do not want to rely totally on division theory this is just for your understanding uh, or like let's say brushing up with the davisian theory or the landscape evolution model of davis which was proposed in 1840 uh, this is a very much textbookish uh, diagram where we have the initial stage with lots of potential energy because of the height height is there then we have the early youth stage where the gullies are forming much of uh, uh, less of lateral erosion and more of vertical erosion is occurring more of vertical erosion lots of uh, energy with the power of power is there with the stream so stream power is greater over here in the late youth which falls down by the time it reaches the full maturity stage more of lateral erosion has started in late maturity we have the meander formation and by the time it comes to the old age the land has got mostly flattened out meanders are forming oxbow lakes are there and so on so this is just a textbookish diagram to understand that how davis has put his framework in terms of landscape evolution model as i said in the beginning that this is the first paradigm of geomorphology that is the erosional cycle proposed by davis paying there were of course many criticism which were uh, which came up little later also and uh, many people have come up with the, the, their own concepts based on the division cycle only or they have tried to put for their own ideas pink was such one person who came up with the uh, idea of formation of pedi plain as against the formation of penny plain which was given by davis where davis speaks of slope decline slope decline or down wearing there is much of down wearing over here and thus the slope decline is there and then there is a formation of a pedi plane uh, sorry penny plane as against this pain came with up with the theory that it is not the slope decline or down wearing but it is the slope recession the slope as you can see it from 
time one, two, three, four, and so on, the slope is receding, and there is more of back wearing rather than the down wearing. And then what we achieve in this particular form, the plane that is being achieved, he calls Peng calls it as the pedi plane. So Peng has given this particular concept, this principle, but this concept couldn't find much of the weightage, or it didn't have that much of but characteristics in it to establish itself as a new principle or a new paradigm at that point of time and that is why division cycle of erosion remain with the addition of the different people who talks about the slope recession and all but it didn't paint theory didn't gain the status of paradigm at that point of time so we come to the second process from uh, sorry second paradigm from the first paradigm we shift on to the second paradigm that is process geomorphology now this particular concept of process geomorphology was originally proposed by gk gilbert who drew upon his engineering background and he basically talked about landforms which are a which are in balance between resisting framework and the forces those are acting to alter the landscape he implied that time is one component of many other components and that will of course affect the appearance of the earth that will form the or that will carve the landforms over there he inferred that the landscape was in equilibrium between the driving forces and resisting forces let us try to understand this concept of gilbert with the help of this particular diagram as we can see at time zero we have this particular landform which is there now if we look at this topmost portion we have different layer data or oh, sorry uh, layered rock strata over here and what we find is that if you look at only the uppermost portion which is shown in orange and green and look from time 0 to time 1 to time 2 we can find the recession or the erosion of this particular portion through the time frame so he says that he says that uh, this particular area is in dynamic equilibrium by this what he means to say that there is an adjustment of the landform between the processes those are operating of erosion and the resistance of the bedrock so you can see the this particular bedrock it is more resistant than this one and that is why this will erode faster and this will also erode eventually but the rate of erosion will be much much slower than the upper one and that is why he talks about the process of erosion that will be in equilibrium with the resistivity forces or the resistance of the bedrock over here so gilbert talks about the dynamic equilibrium now in division geomorphology time was taken as the dominant factor and this particular concept dominated the lit scientific literature until the 1960s so it was john hack who proposed the landscape development and a development that occurred similarly to the way gilbert had espoused it so the way gilbert told us about the processes those were occurring and he em emphasized on process geomorphology that was reiterated by john hack hack recognized however that there were considerable variability in most geomorphic systems and most of them were in dynamic equilibrium by this what i mean is that there is a general balance between the opposing forces that has considerable variation and once they overcome that balance must be reestablished under the new conditions so the concept of dynamic equilibrium uh, started gaining weight at that point of time in geomorphology with dynamic equilibrium came the equilibrium and time concept now these are the basic things you must have learned in geomorphology i'll be very uh, rapidly going through this we have the steady state where we have a very short time Uh, if you look at the time scale over here and there are no changes and that is why the curve there is no curve it is a flattened one no changes over a short time period then the concept of graded time came where you have the small changes coming into existence with as the time uh, scale has increased and due to the fluctuations both basically in the boundary condition and from the graded state we went on to a cyclic time or the dynamic equilibrium where the same changes were occurring over time as the condition dictate and the average condition and if you look at the average condition the average condition was changing so this particular concept started gaining weight 
around the same time now talking about the driving forces those are there in geomorphology which uh, gilbert talked about while talking about the equilibrium concept or later on hack iterated the same thing so there are certain driving forces which will lead to the work that is the work of erosion and there will be certain forces which we will be calling it as the resistivity force uh, sorry resistance force so the driving forces in geomorphology are climate gravity and internal heat so originally recognized as an agent of change by walter pink climate was recognized by him as one of the agent of change and it was ultimately driven by the sun and incoming solar radiation interacting with earth's major systems it is a variable at an uh, of course climate is variable at a number of temporal and spatial scale we all know this that uh, climate is not same everywhere it varies with the space and varies with time and it includes temperature moisture pressure and wind system so all together climate is one of the driving force in geomorphology the second driving force is gravity it acts in conjunction with other driving forces gravity doesn't uh, act solo it will be with climate and with internal heat as well and it determines how much work will operate on all the systems then we have the third driving force in geomorphology which is called as internal heat now this internal heat of the earth it will drive the plate motion and result in the tectonic activities and ultimately it will control the potential energy for work so these are the three driving forces which will cause the work of erosion these are the simple formulas that you will find which are being basically derived from physics in and in incorporated in geomorphology so in simplified terms work is related to the amount of potential energy and the mass of the stuff being transported so how much uh, work will be carried out by a particular agent like say for example a reworm it will depend upon the potential energy that is available at that point of time with the reworm and the mass that, uh, that is that it has to transport so in, on that particular terms only the work will be done and then we have the resisting framework rocks and the structure or the tectonics so the resisting framework deals with the rocks where we know that if uh, the total resisting force of the area will depend upon the strength of the rocks and the sediments those are there that will affect the potential processes that might act upon the material for example let's say some lithologies behave as a brittle solid on the other hand some might behave like a plastic solid or still other might be very hard and more resistive will offer more resistance for the work of erosion but basically they will control the processes at a very variety of temporal and spatial scales so raw the depending upon the characteristics of the rock their resisting power the processes will be uh, different from one place to another then we have the tectonics or the structure which also has a major role to play over here now the structure of the tectonics they causes zones of weakness as we know we have lineaments we have faults we have fractures we have joints which we call as the zones of weaknesses then tectonics also causes redistribution of lithology and they also causes climatic variability to some extent gilbert further talks about the thresholds of change when he is talking about dynamic equilibrium now it is very well implied within the dynamic equilibrium that there will be certain thresholds of change things will not abruptly change or wherever they are changing there will be a threshold of change and some variability is absorbed by the system without discernible change so even if there are changes in the system the changes are so small that they will be absorbed by the system and the change will not be noticed on the other hand some variability forces in the system will be so strong that they will change the particular landform creating a permanent change in the system now two kinds of thresholds are often spoken about the first one is ex extrinsic that is the external threshold for example the climate changes it will uh, have the impact on the threshold over here and the internal internal to the system that is the intrinsic threshold like say for example gulling of stream there is a uh, now it is really very difficult to identify when and what controls the intrinsic thresholds so the intrinsic thresholds will be basically governed by the 
internal characteristics of that particular system how is that particular system and how will it behave or uh, or how it it react to the external uh, thresholds in what manner it will differ from place to place will depend upon a number of factors over here then we have in the process theory the linkages these are very important because a, a, a very simple uh, principle is there that is a domino principle which you must have observed when we uh, have the domino we uh, put the domino in place and just touch the one end of the domino as the first domino falls down the first card falls down the entire domino uh, goes on falling one by one so the process linkage in geomorphology it basically operates on this domino principle one part of a system it, if it changes it will trigger changes in another part and there are many complications which are generated due to this it will complicate the entire process and it will also generate a complex response so in a nutshell when we are talking about the process theory and the introduction of the concept of dynamic equilibrium in geomorphology by gilbert we can say that geomorphologists have used this term dynamic equilibrium to mean balance fluctuations about a constantly changing system condition which has a trajectory of unrepeated states through time and this gilbert's concept of dynamic equilibrium it resembles the balance of forces equilibrium that appears in dynamics so it is changing basically when i'm talking about the term dynamic that it is not static it is going to change however this is merely by analogy rather than derivation now by this statement what i mean is that even though the second paradigm that we are talking about the process theory and the introduction of the principle or the concept of dynamic equilibrium by gilbert is given it is very well written very yes hello am i audible yes ma'am you are audible yes yes audible yeah. uh, so <clears throat> what uh, whatever theory gilbert has given us about the process theory uh, sorry process uh, geomorphology and the dynamic equilibrium this this particular statement i was trying to explain that this is merely by analogy rather than derivation means that the concept is more descriptive in nature he has tried to describe it remember this was the era when people were not going in for quantification so they were putting the uh, theories whether it was wm davis or maybe little later on gilbert they were putting up the theories on observations and other such things characteristics of the landform and that is why it was put forth merely by analogy by description and there was no uh, derivation that was being uh, uh, taken concluding conclusion was drawn from a particular derivation that was being put forth however his conceptualization has several characteristics which are very important to us even today by describing internal behavior within a system let's say for a drainage basin it constitutes a process description as well as a statement of a condition so gilbert talks about the entire processes those will be there in a drainage basin and also he talks about the condition of those processes he talks about the uh, resistive forces the working process and the actual work that will be carried out his theory it is a scale dependent theory however it was limited to drainage basin although why the adjustment should terminate at the basin boundary was not much explained by gilbert at that point of time this particular theory focused on mass rather than the actual energy transfer and it embraces a crude expression of forms thus gilbert's concept of dynamic equilibrium must be regarded as uniquely geomorphological in origin we come to the third concept that is quantitative dynamic geomorphology now the process theory or the pro process geomorphology paradigm that we have seen which was given by uh, gilbert it as i told you it was more descriptive in nature rather than quantitative so there was a shift from that particular thought of describing the phenomena to quantifying the phenomena or quantifying everything that you are going to study and this was a period somewhere in 1940s or 1950s when we have hotten and struller who came up with drainage basin morphology 
this is a very simple diagram of drainage a particular drainage and you must have done it some point of time or the other uh, numbering or the ordering of the streams as first order stream second order stream third order stream and so on either by using the hotten method or stranger method or little later we have the shrew method also so there is quantification where uh, not only the ordering of the stream is done then little later on we talk about the density of the streams lengths of the streams the ratios of the a stream in terms of bifurcation ratio and so on so this quantification was done at a little later stage but let us try and relate kuhn's model of paradigm shift over here at this point of time what we have earlier to quantitative dynamic geomorphology we had process geomorphology and the inclusion of dynamic equilibrium which was basically given by gilbert now hotten had its base in that particular concept in this earlier paradigm and from that paradigm it picked up the things and it moved ahead with quantitative quantitating the things quantifying the things rather over here so hotten when he they talk about the drainage basin morphology they are deriving or they are trying to rather establish the theory which was given by gilbert that is the process theory so here again i cannot actually in real sense say that there was a shift from the earlier paradigm to the next paradigm again i'll repeat the uh, statement of kuhn where he says that the paradigm shift will only uh, only and only occur if the previous paradigm is totally refuted discarded so here we can see the previous uh, paradigm that is the process geomorphology and the equilibrium a dynamic equilibrium is not refuted that forms the base and there is an addition or there is the re ascertaining of that particular theory but in by quantifying the things those who were done by hotten and straller at a little later date not only they emphasized or they established the fact which were being given by gilbert they also established certain facts like the uh let's say how the way, uh, the way the streams the first order streams will be behaving the second order will be behaving or let's say fourth and fifth order streams will be behaving uh, as far as the processes are concerned they also tried to take the help of the first paradigm that is the devisions theory of cycle of erosion we move on to the fourth paradigm in geomorphology that is thermodynamic geomorphology now this thermodynamic concept or even the equilibrium concept we are deriving these concepts from physics remember whatever we are talking about in geography or in geomorphology we are deriving most of the terms and most of the knowledge from the pure sciences like we are deriving some knowledge from biology we are deriving some knowledge from physics some from chemistry and so on so the thermodynamic principle or the law of thermodynamics is being borrowed from physics and here this was the era this was the period when people started talking about systems as closed system isolated system or an open system so this particular period is also called as or this uh, thermodynamic geomorphology which i am talking about in some literature they are giving it a name as the systems approach period where the paradigm of system approach had uh, been accepted at that point of time so coming back to this particular thermodynamic approach i'm only mentioning here a closed system there will be a different way in which there will be uh, the thermo thermodynamic principle will be acting for an isolated system or maybe for a open system let's say for example in closed systems the total amount of energy which is there is always conserved because it is a closed system and this over here we are borrowing from the first law of thermodynamics which says that in a closed system energy will always get or energy is conserved the amount of available energy inevitably decreases to zero so this particular uh, thing that we are take talking about that the energy going on decreasing to achieve the point of zero is dictated by the second law of thermodynamics and the th entropy of the system 
now what is entropy the amount of unusable energy that is available in that particular system it will increase to a maximum now coming to this particular concept of entropy because in thermodynamic geomorphology we will find that many works were carried out on this particular concept of open system closed system isolated system and emphasis was more given on this amount of unusable energy that is entropy now what is entropy if you want to just strictly define it it is a thermodynamic quantity representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy of for conversion into mechanical work often interpreted as the degree of disorder or randomness in the system or it is merely lack of order or predictability gradual decline into disorder so the energy in the system is going to gradually decrease and it will come to a level of zero whatever even though whatever energy we find it might be there it is unusable energy work cannot be carried on further so this particular concept entropy concept of thermodynamic geomorphology is presently being applied to a number of studies uh, in terms of entropy balance in earth surface system in geomorphology it was around 1970 so you see it was around mid to late uh, 20th century it was scheidegger again scheidegger in 1970 he has written a very uh, good essay uh, related to this particular concept of entropy balance in earth surface system where he suggests that in physics what they talk about entropy is the t that is temperature and h is enthalpy he says for geomorphology we can talk in terms of t temperature equivalent or at par as h height and the enthalpy as m or the mass so if we consider that then the entropy balance equation will become mass upon height so we'll have mass upon height and if we take it that into consideration then i'll come to the next point but before that there was a modification which was given by clyden et al in 2013 uh, related to entropy balance and they say that instead of only considering the mass directly we can think in terms of why we are talking about the mass over here try to understand we are talking about the uh, amount of usable energy that is there over, that is present or the free energy that is present over here so clydon is talking about the free energy here he says that clydon energy will be equal to a where a is actually what the potential plus the kinetic energy of water and sediments so we know that if we have a flat surface then the potential energy will be relatively very 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 less as on the other hand if you have a raised surface then the potential energy will be very high and this potential energy will be further converted into kinetic energy higher the potential energy more will be the kinetic energy by law so he say, uh, here what uh, scheidegger has suggested that all natural processes are example of maximum entropy production processes so if we have free energy of our system uh, surface system it will decrease with time whatever energy free energy is there in the system it has to decrease with time as i told you the second law, uh, law of thermodynamics and secondly if the maximum entropy production happens it will only happen if mass of the earth surface system increases so if you look at this particular uh, equation if mass increases then naturally the mep or the maximum entropy production will increase or the other way around if h decreases then also you will have maximum entropy production maximum entropy production will also happen if free energy decreases and it will cause what will it cause chaos or disorder because the entropy production has increased highly increased that means there uh, the energy that is available it is unusable and there the work that has to be carried out over there is not they are not able the uh, system is not able to carry out that particular work and that is why you will have disorder in the earth surface system it will go uh, it will not remain in balance and in such all such uh, circumstances ess will become increasingly non linear and unpredictable the predictability of ess will no longer remain 
Now in thermodynamic geomorphology, there is another aspect. Now this aspect is also carried forward in the fifth paradigm also. And this is fractals. Fractal studies are really gaining a lot of uh, weightage these days. And this particular principle is also being uh, uh, floated over here. Uh, a what is a fractal? Fractal is a pattern that the laws of nature repeat at different scale. So if you look at a particular geometric shape, what is the shape? Suppose, let's say, for example, you have a snowflake. So when you're looking at the snowflake, it is a larger snowflake. And when you go on, when you put the snowflake under the microscope, you will find that within the snowflakes, there are tiny, tiny particles. And they, those all are resembling the same shape, same geometric shape, which is of that larger snowflake. Now, let's say another example I have put over here, just as a stone at the base of a foothill, which can resemble in a miniature form the mountain from which it originally tumbled down. So the fractals are self-similar, whether you view from a very close uh, distance or even you go far away, they will be presenting a self-similar pattern. And this term fractal, it was con coined by Benoit in 1975. And it comes from a Latin word fractus, meaning an irregular surface like that of a broken stone. You have numerous examples and uh, numerous studies are now being carried out in uh, geomorphology also. Uh, one example again I have cited here of a forest. Trees are natural fractals, patterns that repeat smaller and smaller copies of themselves to create the biodiversity of a forest. If you look at uh, the fractal geometry and try to correlate it with the, uh, the geomorphology, then many landscapes show fractal pattern. They show power law, uh, power, power law scaling and evolve self-similarity. There are studies on the coastline. If you try to uh, just look at the coastline of a particular area at a larger scale and try to understand the geometry, what is the geometric shape of that particular coast, and then zoom in into the smaller area of the same coast, you will fi surprisingly find that it uh, shows you the similar pattern that was there for the larger area. So more you zoom in, more self-similarity you will be observing over here. So people are studying the, fract the fractal dimensions of the coastline also. If landscape morphology follows chaos theory, simple perturbations can cause complex geopatterns and drastic response in non-linear manner can be exhibited. But when we are talking about the self-similarity and we are also talking about the chaos theory over here and the catastrophic uh, or the drastic responses which are more in non-linear manner. Remember, whenever we are talking about the progradation as in uh, not linear but non-linear, this means predictions are very difficult. So in such situations, predictions or the forecasting, the term that is being coined as earth cast of extreme events like floods, landslide, etc. will become difficult. Mathemat in such cases, we'll have to take more help of mathematical mor morphologic analysis, which may help us in earth casting. Again, when I'm talking about mathematical morphologic analysis, remember, I'm studying the morphological parameters over here. I'm studying the morphology of a region, but in purview of the implementation of the mathematical models. So again, I'm deriving from the field of mathematics. The last paradigm over here is predictive geomorphology. I have told you that new term is being, um, being utilized now when we are talking about the prediction of extreme events like floods, landslides, and so on. We call them as earthcast, abbreviation of forecasting, earthcast. Now, this is the era where we have moved from the descriptive kind of geomorphology to understanding the processes, to a quantification of the processes, quantifying it. So quantitative geography was there. We are trying to understand the implication of thermodynamics in geomorphology, incorporating the rules of thermodynamics in geomorphology and understanding the formation of the landforms in that particular perspective. To, uh, then we moved on to the uh, terms like fractals, uh, geometry over here, and then we come to predictive geomorphology. Today, if you look at 
and east research that is being carried on people are more uh, worried about prediction if you, uh, and i am very sure because you all are doing your uh, phd work over here uh, whatever topic it is when you are giving any presentation a first question is being asked whatever work you are doing it is very good maybe the results are very good but what is the applicability of that particular work so try and understand today is the era that we are moving out of the paradigms of quant only quantifying or only describing or only understanding the different rules and sets of rules over there we are trying to go a step ahead and we are more interested today in understanding the applicability of our research and applicability of our research will only be proved if we are able to predict let's say for example a particular student is doing his study in fluvial geomorphology and working on a number of floods over the major rivers or may a particular river or a different rivers in per se of india or maharashtra or whatever area it is and he has the flood frequency data for last 100 years he has analyzed it he has been able to come up with very very good results like when were the sporadic floods occurring what was its uh, uh, let's say uh, what was its uh, um, uh, frequency or what till what level it has achieved and so on so the results are fantastic but the student stops at that particular point just by explaining that in past 100 years this is this is things have happened and these were the years of extreme events of floods and maybe he is also able to correlate that with the local events like what was the cause of flood whether the rainfall was more or whatever is the reason for that particular flood event and the student stops at that particular point no today is not the era of stopping at that particular time today is the era that we have to go in for predictions earth cast so we should be able at the end of our that particular study we should be able to predict like say for example in last 100 years what was the flood a normal flood frequency of a particular intensity flood occurring over the that particular river over a particular area so what what is the probability that you can predict it in terms of how much intensity will be there and which areas will be flooded what are the probabilities of that particular area to get flooded and in such situations suggest those areas so that your study becomes more applicable by prediction so as i said today is the area of predictive geomorphology today is also the area a particular time frame when we are talking about geomorphological studies by borrowing more and more not only from physics and chemistry but from mathematics and geometry also so we are talking about mathematical morphology you'll find that uh, in cases when you have a very limited data set you cannot uh, go in or venture into the field for a longer time or uh, due to the risk factor or many other factor there is a, a approach which we called as the empirical approach and we go in for mathematical modeling so mathematics is going uh, is already there in geomorphology and has to play a major role in morphological studies so as i told you about fractal geometry then of course nowadays everyone wants to go in and venture into this new field that is uh, geoscience or ge geographical information system or very much uh, literally called as geoinformatics in today's period but again uh, we have to remember geoinformatics or geoscience is not a concept it is not a paradigm it is merely a tool which is going to enhance which is going to help us in establishing our work in putting our work in a more um, uh, say positive way or emphasizing it in a more better way then in today's period we also have what is called as deterministic and numerical models most of the work that we carry out in geography or geomorphology it is not deterministic it is stochastic basically geography is is a stochastic science not a deterministic science but still today people are trying to establish can we determine 
that x plus like say when we talk about deterministic we know that x plus y will always yield me answer equal to c let's say for example whether the place will change or no whether time will change or no but as i said geography or geomorphology is stochastic in nature not deterministic so we know that my equation x plus y is c will be at a particular place but the same equation may not be applicable at other place because the factors will change the things will change the characteristics will change from one place to another from one time to another so there is a need for inclusion of numerical models so you have to generate them in numerical models depending upon your study area and people are doing this particular in but in particularly in number of different uh, researchers and coming to the last one that is of course i cannot say it is the last one there are many more uh, fact coming up now but uh, here it is artificial neural network now artificial neural network or ann it is gaining much 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 more prominence in geomorphology and there are number of work those are being carried out using this ann in collaboration with geosciences with gis so this was about the predictive geomorphology so what we have seen that there are different paradigms here i have spoken about five basic paradigms in geomorphology first one we saw the cycle of erosion which was there which was a evolutionary geomorphology then came a period of process geomorphology dynamic equilibrium then came a time of horton and uh, horton and straller that was the period of um, uh, let's say continuity geomorphology which we moved on to the next level we had the uh, emphasis on entropy analysis so thermodynamic geomorphology and lastly i'm speaking about the predictive geomorphology now to conclude my talk over here the pattern of acceptance of new ideas into mainstream of geomorphological education over the time is really interesting now the lag between the conception of new ideas and their incorporation into mainstream texts has varied from negligible to more than 200 years what we have seen is that on one hand despite the fact that the assumptions were then untestable like say for example the division cycle of erosion it gained rapid favor as the dominant paradigm of the early 20th century before it was found wanting means before the critic criticisms were raised by the critics it immediately has gained the favor in contrast to this concepts of uniform flow slope stability and others confirmed in the 18th century waited almost 200 years for incorporation into geomorphology text sensu stricto although they had long been available in books on hydraulics and soil mechanics they were not accepted easily in the mainstream of geomorphology we also had the theories of continental mobilization which had a very wild ride it took a lot of time to be accepted culminating in the eventual acceptance of the plate tectonics paradigm in the later 20th century explanations for the fate of these and other ideas are really varied new ideas are often opposed by establishment conservatism language barriers the perceived surrealism of new concepts and simple ignorance in contrast new ideas may be accepted sooner or later by virtue of simplicity forceful and well connected leadership or the death of opponents although mitigated by the information revolution of recent decades these forces still persist and influence the extension of new ideas into a larger area now before i stop i like to add over here that complete revolutions in geography have not taken place numerous schools of thought are marching side by side in search of new paradigms which can help in ascertaining the geographical personality of a particular region let's say geographers are dividing themselves in the category of positivist pragmatist maybe phenologist extensionalist idealist realists and also dialectics materialistics and so on this is a crisis phase what we are facing today is the crisis phase with revolution which shall lead to new paradigm phase and douglas sherman in 1996 has written a very good article uh, you can visit it on the google uh, and you can just find out what he has written over there 
uh, he has titled his essay as fashion in geomorphology where he talks about kuhn's model of scientific revolution through paradigm failure cannot and he stress that this particular manner model cannot be applied to geomorphology as a coherent discipline and an alternative explanation for disciplinary evolution must be sought now why it is so a uh, chairman there he says that we must recognize that geomorphology did not exist as a distinct intellectual enterprise prior to the later half of the 19th century prior to division theory it was not there then the contentious discussions over the content and practice of geomorphology are ample evidence that our discipline is not presently united by a single paradigm or even a set of paradigm for that matter nor has it been for more than half a century right now and certainly no serious student of the recent history of geomorphology would argue that the geographical cycle was refuted completely in the manner required by kuhn in favor of an alternative paradigm i told you when we were discussing uh, the paradigm of division cycle that even though at that point of time i said that division cycle was say refuted or discarded and the new theories came into existence but till today we know that we are learning we are teaching this particular theory in the uh, through the textbooks of geomorphology to the students so this means we have not completely refuted the theory so if we want to uh, say really believe in the concept that is given by kuhn for the paradigm and paradigm shifts that for the pa old paradigm to be shifting into the new paradigm the old paradigm should totally be discarded it cannot be applied to geomorphology and this is because uh, like shenman and many other people uh, argue that it can be said that geomorphology is not the normal science because it is deriving so many things from so many different sciences as i told you like it is deriving from physics chemistry biology or maths and geometry and so on so when we are talking about the paradigms and paradigm shifts we can say that there are number of paradigms there was a phase that people have shifted from that particular concept to the other but at the same time the old paradigm still exist in some form or the other there is a need if you look at paradigm there is a need of coming up with some focused idea or a new paradigm which has to yet evolve and as i stress again we are in the phase of crisis or a revolution and we are waiting for the next paradigm thank you thank you thank you ma'am yes thank you ma'am yes thank you ma'am uh participants if you have any questions you can please ask any clarifications not necessarily with the research aspect otherwise also anything in geomorphology the paradigms associated uh was it too heavy <laughs> <laughs> yes any queries or questions san roy has put it put in the comments fashion in geomorphology i and this yes. was commented 415 just a few minutes ago yes that uh, uh, that is the article very good article written by douglas shaman in 1996 it is available the pdf is available on net so he basically the he thinks in terms of uh, like we talk about paradigms instead of that he has used the word fashion from the fashion yeah. industry okay 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 thank you ma'am got i will take it thank you ma'am okay may i ask a question please yes yeah i have a question uh, do paradigm uh, sorry paradigm uh, keep on repeating have you ever noticed uh, see basically when uh, we talk about paradigms the basic or the fundamental thing itself is that the old paradigm should become obsolete which should be replaced by a new paradigm so in that sense in that sense a uh, paradigm never repeats but as i said in geomorphology we we find that there is no single paradigm which is you know uh, ruling uh, the entire scenario 
I don't know whether I was clear or not in this point. Parad repetition of paradigm is not possible because of the simple, simple fundamental principle that is being given by Kuhn of shifting of paradigms. See, whatever uh, thoughts have been postulated in the past, it may be possible that in coming uh, future, it may be repeated. Thoughts will remain as it is. What will be uh, there, it will be the addition of your knowledge in the present context. So when you are adding something, you are not uh, referring to the old one, old version of it in totality. So a particular uh, concept was given and uh, due to the advancement in the technology or advancement in our knowledge or scientific world or whatever it is, we have come to know many, many more things which are better understood than the previous one. So the older versions will not be taken up. It will not repeat. What will be there again, I'll repeat, it is the addition to the older one. Yes, anyone else? If you're done with the questions, then we can go for the final uh, formal vote of thanks, please. Now I am here to propose a lot of thanks. First of all, of all I extend my sincere gratitude towards Dr. Anar Gamal to give us his valuable time and guidance for the paradigms in geomorphology. His guidance is very useful for our future research work. Second, I express my gratitude for organizing committee and for Dr. Dr. Devani sir, Dr. Ganesh Navale sir, and HOD Dr. Sunil Bhakar sir, and our college principal Dr. Dhapar madam. Last but least, I extend my gratitude towards those who were present in this lecture. Thank you. Once again, thank you, madam. Thank you. Devni, sir, can I leave? Devni, sir, can I leave? Dhawre, sir, is there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.